Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandalmongers podcast. Andrew, are you ready for episode 59? Can you believe it? Gosh, this that is exciting. I really feel things are taking off. The, the Kitty Kelly seemed to go down very well. Yeah, we're recording this about a day after Kitty Kelly went out, and it's uh, it's just about hitting two thousand views on YouTube, which is pretty good for a day. Um, I was a bit disappointed with Suez. I blame myself for this. I call it Shadows of the Empire, and I reckon a lot of people thought, "God, that sounds dull." Well, maybe not. Well, I think the thing is we have lots of different sorts of listeners and maybe we have more listeners for certain subjects than other other subjects. doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with serious subjects. And we were keen to have a Canadian spokesman. Oh, yes. So, I thought that it was a fascinating conversation and I would urge people to take a look or a listen. But sometimes you have to sell, sell, sell. This is my TV background, Andrew. I should have called, like, like for example, the White Mischief Programme, Shadows of the Empire, White Mischief. I should have said drunken aristocrats having sex and shooting each other. I mean, it's the same story, <laughs> but I bet it would have got a bigger crowd. Yes, we'll, we'll do that in the future. What, what are we going to call uh, this one then? Oh, that's a very good question, actually. I don't know. I mean, Agatha Christie what... kind of sells herself, doesn't she? But She does. And and um, we've had, we've been aware, we've had not enough female subjects and female interviewees. So we've got very true. both uh, this week. Uh, and and maybe Laura will be as popular as uh, Kitty was. Well, let's hope so. I mean, Laura is one of our best friends, and we just love her to bits. So um, I'm looking forward to talking to her. Let's just catch up a little bit. Um, people writing to us and commenting. And another email, Brendan Curry from Fairfax, Virginia, in the good old USA, has written to us to say we should look at the Formula One scandal, which is quite interesting, yep. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. There's some good ideas coming through. I would just say, because we we're doing two a week. Um, we we're, we're going to go through a lot of material. We are, and we've also slightly changed it a little bit. We're currently putting them out on Sunday and Wednesday, as opposed to the old way of doing it on Monday. But we reserve all we reserve the right to change it around again. We're told that people like to like to look more like to listen on a Sunday night than on a Monday. Yeah, I think so. Especially we do have quite a lot of listeners in Australia and New Zealand, and of course. Sunday for us would be it's, it's Sunday morning for them. So they've got all day to listen to it while they're out walking their dogs or whatever people do down there on a Sunday, have barbecues, as I recall. It's pretty popular. Um, it's loads of comments on uh, on Kitty, actually. Love to name check people. Um, we did surprise a few people, actually. Jan White, 6038. I was sitting feeling bored and then a scandal mongers pops up. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Isn't that nice? Well, lots of nice, lots of nice comments. Elizabeth. Basford saying that we're thought provoking, intelligent, and we're rare to, it's rare to find quality like this, which is lovely to hear. Um, but a lot of people, Tina Jesse, one of them, Tina Jesse 859, thought it was very, very funny when you couldn't turn your phone off. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, well, we've had the road work set since. So um, I, we were warned. We should have a whip round and maybe do a crowdfunder to get you a decent smartphone. Yes, yes, yes. That that would be lovely. Um, all right. Now, Agatha, this episode. Well, I mean, you 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 heard Laura come and speak in Putney Library. Um, I've not heard her speak on Agatha. So, what what what's in store for us? Yes, as um, my, my my wife runs uh, manages Putney Library in South West London, and uh, Laura, who's become a bit of a pal since we've done these interviews, came to talk to a really good crowd. Sixty odd people showed up. And um, she's written the most wonderful biography of Agatha, really perceptive and thoughtful and surprising. Um, yeah, I agree. And the kind of focus, the hinge of Agatha Christie's life is this famous scandal where she, um, you know, Laura will explain, but you know, she, her marriage is falling apart. She has what appears to be a breakdown. She disappears. Nobody knows where she is for I think, nearly two weeks. She um, goes to Yorkshire where people go when these yeah. things happen. Someone was lucky enough to be born there. But yes, she goes to a very posh hotel, which you can still visit in the spa town of Harrogate. It's a rather prim and proper Yorkshire town, quite fancy, quite kind of upmarket. And um, she basically just lives in this hotel. And 
people sort of recognize her, but maybe they're too polite to say, oh, you that famous novelist has disappeared. <laughs> That's all over the papers at the moment. Yes. yes. And meanwhile, but being British, they don't. Yeah, and the papers are going mad with the story, all sorts of crazy suggestions. She's been murdered, she's been kidnapped, she's disguised herself as a man and is traveling Europe, all this stuff. Um, but uh, she's a different writer and a different person to this experience, and that's why uh, kind of Laura puts it as a sort of pivot point in her life. Um, so that's really that's really good. Should we go and talk to her? I think we should. Yes, I, right. ca I can't wait. Let's do it. Here we go. Welcome back, Laura. Hello. I think no, is she the only one we've had three times? I think you're the, you're the first person to be. You're the first times. person to come. And yes. Come on. Let's let's, ah, let's show and let's... tell. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. I'm afraid I haven't got my mug. I've got cool down. Oh, oh, very <laughs> Sorry, no, very disloyal. Very, but, very honoured to be your first um, hat trick, as it were. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, you write such good books and yeah. scandalous books. Oh, well, we this try. this partly flowed from a wonderful talk Laura gave at uh, Putney Library, which is managed by my dear wife, Frances. Um, and I thought, this is great stuff. We must put it on the podcast. Well, it was a, it was great fun to do. Um, it's lovely to meet Frances. And, uh, well, I'm always I'm always up for talking about Agatha Christie. It's, um, you know, I spent, what, three years of my life or whatever researching and writing that book, but, it, but she still absolutely fascinates me. So far away. Well, let's start, let's start at the beginning, because we often rush ahead to the juicy yep. bits. But with Agatha, it's all juicy bits, isn't it? Um, <laughs> shall we, you know, a little bit about her early life and how she became initially famous um, and then maybe getting into her marriage and before things started to go a bit wrong for her? Yeah. And she was truly a global figure, quite young, wasn't she? Well, well, I don't, I don't know about that, really. I mean, she... She started off not seeing her writing career in in terms that we would recognize today. You know, she had no strategy or um, you know plans to become what she became. That, in a way, it really took off in a mega way after the Second World War. Um, but she was very successful during the 1930s and made a huge amount of money during the 1930s before tax became, you know, as exigent as it, as it would become. But one of the reasons why the 1926 disappearance, which I know we're going to talk about, one of the reasons why some people have said, oh, it was a publicity stunt, was because it did make her a lot more famous. But um, I'm... 100% sure that was not her intention. I mean, it was really television and, and, and films that really sort of brought her to a global audience, wasn't it? I mean, much later on. It was really. I mean, what massively made a difference was Witness for the Prosecution. The play, which of course is, I think it's still on now in London, uh, the play in the 50s and then the film of it, the Billy Wilder film, um, and also even even something like the 1945 film of and um, then there were none. I mean, she hated. Well, she didn't hate Witness. She loved that, but um, she hated all those films and all that kind of thing. But she was not a screen person at all. But they did. Yeah, they made a huge difference. And in a weird way, the the this immense, completely unforeseen fame that she acquired enabled her to live with the extreme privacy that she, that, um, that she really needed. Um, but in a weird way, she did live hand to mouth because she was always in trouble through absolutely no fault of her own. She was always in trouble with tax bills and was twice advised to go bankrupt, which amazed me almost more than anything I discovered. Um, and it was it, it was really her her agent, and it, you know he was like a gentleman, and he took on this nice lady, and it, none of it was foreseen. And um, what were tax rates at that time? I mean, they were in the nineteen nineties, weren't they? 90s? Oh, I mean, insane. I mean, you know, you don't have to be um, rabidly right wing to think that they were insane. Um, it, it's 
they, yes, I mean, she she said she wrote. I remember reading a letter she wrote to her agent, and she said, "You tell me I've earned thirty thousand pounds. Where is it?" And he said, um, "I can only tell you, Mr. Butler, i.e., Rab Butler." And it was uh, she got into difficulties in the late nineteen thirties. She made a lot of money from America, America's uh, American serialization of her books. She made really good money from. And then there was a test case in America about what tax rates should apply. I won't go into all the boring details, but the, the test case went on and on. And then there was the war. And so she was being, there was money being held in America that she needed to pay tax rate, huge tax bills over here. And it just became this mire from which she was unable to extricate herself. Okay, um, okay. Well, look, I, this, I, I think this podcast on personal finance, we are not. Shall we go <laughs> back? Can we go back to the 20s? Andrew, stop it. Stop rushing ahead. Because <laughs> I mean, that's really the what I want to talk about. Um, yes. The first, I, said, I got it, obviously got it completely wrong. She wasn't really famous. She was a, a, a growing fame. And then suddenly yes. she's on the cover of every newspaper in the world. Tell me about that. The disappearance. Yeah, and, and the years leading up to it. Yeah, okay. Yes, when she was glad to earn £25 for her first book. Um, that's the difference that we're sort of highlighting here. Um, well, so she was born on September the 15th, 1890. She was born in Torquay, as I'm sure most people will know. Um, a very... She always portrayed it as a very secure, happy family life. Um, by modern standards, you could probably insert various degrees of trauma into it. Her father died when she was um, just 11. Um, you could call it a, a lonely childhood. She had two siblings, a brother, Monty, Madge, her sister, who were 10, 11 years older than her. But that all suited her very, very well. She was incredibly close to her mother, Clara incredibly close to her and her upbringing was a mixture of security because she had her mother and also freedom because she was on her own not lonely and her imagination sort of blossomed um and it, it was a you know Torquay was a very regulated ordered place and with its social hierarchies and everything. And the Millers, as she was, Agatha Miller, fitted in very well into that. And it was, so it was, you see the sort of, um, the, the, as I say, the hierarchies, the order, the, the, the structure that underpins her detective fiction, but also this, uh, this ability to let her mind roam free. And she was always very creative. Um, Initially, she wanted to be a singer. She wanted to be an opera singer. That was her most passionate dream, always, all her life. And she did have a very good voice, but it wasn't strong enough. Music was her great passion. Wagner, all the, you know, the real big guns. Um, <laughs> the beautiful piano at um, her house at Greenway, which is now National Trust in Devon. Uh, so, but it was, and she grew up, you know, they didn't have much money. It wasn't a privileged life in that respect. Her father had, in a gentlemanly fashion, sort of squandered or not taken notice of money. So there wasn't an awful lot of money, but it was, in those days, you could be privileged without money in that way, really. So she grew up, a, she was a very attractive girl. She had this marvellous blonde hair that she could sort of sit on, tall, very slim, looked very different from her image of her. And very attractive, you know, she had marriage proposals and all this sort of thing. And she fell madly in love with this, frankly, pretty dishy looking bloke, Archie Christie, um, whom she met at a dance. He didn't have any money either. Um, the mother, Clara, her mother was keen for her not to marry him. She said, I think he could be ruthless. And she was right but that was the one time in her life really that Agatha ignored her mother and they did marry. They married on Christmas Eve, 1914. So, 
you know, you feel the instant pressure of that date. It was a hurried, they married in a registry office. He was um, in the Royal Flying Corps, so, you know, liable to be killed at any moment. It was a real Romeo and Juliet job, but he did survive the war. She became uh, a, a nurse, a BAD. Uh, they set up a hospital in Torquay. During the war, she wrote the Mysterious Affair at Styles, which is her first book. She'd already written a novel that nobody knows anything about. I thought it was quite good, actually, not detective fiction. Um, Styles was turned down by, I think it was five publishers. Well done, guys. Uh, and eventually published in 1920. By which time Archie was back from the war, of course. They had a daughter, Rosalind, Agatha's only child, and they were living in London. And apparently the marriage was, you know, he'd come back from the war, he was he seemed fine, everything was fine. And they were sort of, as she would have seen it, set fair to have a very happy life together. He he encouraged her to write. He wasn't the sort of husband who said, No, you will cook my dinner. Not, not like that at all. But the, I suppose the differences between them, and I remember her son-in-law saying to me, you couldn't imagine two people less alike. He knew Agatha very well, he knew Archie, but that was not, a, it's not apparent when you're young and fancy people, obviously. But after the war, they did start to, they moved to Sunningdale, which is, you know, pure commute about. He worked in the city. He was a passionate golfer and sort of part of the gin and golf set, which was completely not Agatha. And gradually, but things underneath the surface, I suppose, were starting to, to change between them. But I don't think it would have been apparent and I don't think things would have come to a head necessarily because in those days you stayed married, mm. but they didn't um, because in 1926, Agatha's mother died in April, which was like so devastating to her. I think her mother was the most important person in her life. He was the love of her life. Her mother died in April. She went down to the family home in Torquay, Ashfield, and did that atrociously painful thing of turning out the things, finding the letters, finding all those signs of love and, you know, childhood memories, et cetera, et cetera. He wanted her to come back home. He wanted them to go on holiday together and sort of pull her out of it because he was quite a brisk sort of man. She said, no, 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 I can't. I'm in grief too much, you know, grief stricken, blah, blah, blah. Stayed down in Torquay. She always regretted that waited for him to come. He came down finally in August of Torquay for Rosalind's seventh birthday party and told her that he was in love with another woman and wanted a divorce. So when people talk about this disappearance, these 11 days in December, 1926, when Agatha Christie was missing, as if it's like in a vacuum. But when you look at the buildup, this woman who'd had a reason, you know, a really rather happy, protected life mm. for nearly 36 mm. years. And then this double blow of losing your mother and your husband in the space of four months. None of it really surprises me. It all seems to me quite inevitable. Oh, that you would and he told that. her on the day of her daughter's birthday party. Well, he didn't. I don't think he told her that day. He, okay. She'd been down there with the daughter. And nobody would say that Agatha was a particular. A maternal woman. Um, they ended up very close, Agatha and her daughter, but she was she was not a maternal woman. Um, but so she was down at Torquay with her daughter, but the real consolation was her dog, um, Peter the dog, who she absolutely adored and would cling to at night. Uh he came down, it was clear that something was wrong. And then there's this terrible conversation that she relays in her autobiography where he says, I've been seeing, seeing quite a lot of that girl, you know, Nancy. And she says, well, why shouldn't you? And then he says, you don't understand. Um, and um, so I'm really not surprised that, that her, I don't know what the technical term for it would be. 
her, her, she had a breakdown, her mental health gave way, whatever. It's not surprising. So, I mean, they created the story of a lost, you know, amnesia, which was, wasn't true, but it was to protect the way what happened because i mean the impression from the book is actually she was reasonably conscious about what she was doing this this period of disappearance yes it's a really it's a difficult one i mean there are many different views on this from the you know the the, the sort of brigade who say she was completely conscious of what she was doing and she was trying to get archie trying to make him feel terrible trying to get she was motivated by vindictiveness if you like vengeance um i don't buy that for one second then you get the absolute opposing camp that say she lost her memory she did not know what she was doing i don't buy that either i think it's somewhere in between the two whereby she is she's she's agatha christie she's a plotter she set up a plot if you like she drove her car to this place, Newlands Corner, which is in Surrey, but it's it's pretty wild. It's the North Downs, it's vertiginous, it's rather beautiful, but also quite scary. She left her car at the bottom of, a, 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 of the slope, overlooking a, a quarry, like a suicide, really. She left clues inside the car, her driving license, etc. And then she went to the, this hotel in Harrogate, which everybody knows about, which was where she was found. Um, she drove away from home on the 3rd of December and she was found on the 14th of December. Uh, and she used the name of the- in plain sight, yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry to drop, but she also used the name of the girlfriend. Yes. Uh, exactly. Signed in, which was a bit of a clue. Exactly, yes. She called herself Teresa Neal. The girlfriend was Nancy Neal. But what she did, and I do blame the police here. Uh, there was this deputy chief con who was in charge of the thing, Kenwood, who was absolutely fixated on the idea that she was dead, either by her own hand or by Archie Christie's, and was hobnobbing with journalists and, you know, loving it. And the journalists were sort of writing these stories, which... You know, if I were reading them now, I'd think, oh, my God, the husband, the husband's done it. He's going to be arrested. I mean, it's really reprehensible. Um, and so far from Agatha's intention. But what she'd done on the morning of the 4th of December, so she's in transit. She is in London, from Surrey in London, en route to Harrogate, posted in London on the Saturday was a letter to her brother-in-law, Campbell Christie. And my reading of it, he was the only person who sort of had a foot in both camps, close to Archie and very close to Agatha. She wrote him a letter, which he told the police said, I'm very unhappy, I'm not well, I'm going to a spa in Yorkshire. But he destroyed the letter because presumably it also said a lot of stuff like, and your brother is, you know. <laughs> anyway, he destroyed it, but he kept the envelope and the police completely ignored it and said, oh, well, there's no evidence that she posted it. Maybe Archie posted it or maybe, you know, something like that. So the real clue that she left, the real clue, which I think was meant to make Archie go and find her, because that was what she wanted. She wanted to get him back. She didn't want to do things that would repel him forever, which is what effectively did happen. I think she thought that she could create this thing and it would remain private between the two of them. Because the fact that it became a national scandal, the fact that it became this tabloid sensation like you would not believe. I mean, I spent days reading the newspapers because there was just tons of it. Um, all saying slightly different things, weren't they? Yeah, oh, yes, and very wildly sensationalist. I mean, a bit like Lord Lucan, you know, oh, we've seen her here, we've seen her there, you know, she's disguised as a man. I mean, just crazy. And it, it just went mega, really, because of this policeman, I think. It, 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 it was pretty clearly, you know, a marital 
thing that had gone wrong and she'd taken herself off. But Archie started speaking to the press, which of course is fatal. Then they got on to the fact that there was a girlfriend. And it was, it, it the idea that that was Agatha's intention. You know, in her book, she's very good at the difference between intent. She's very good at cause and effect in her book. And I think if she'd been thinking clearly in her right mind, she would have seen that her intention might not have the effect that it had. So events over overtook them, really. Because then you have, a, I think, a very yeah. interesting bit, bit in the book where you say, having, as she thought, helped to destroy her marriage by leaving Archie alone while she grieved for her mother. She had now delivered its death blow by making herself an object of public ridicule and Archie an object of public loathing. And in some ways, that sets him away rather than bringing him to her. That's my reading of it. And what, was the do what was the daughter told? I mean, she must have been terrified. I uh, know. Yeah, it's it's well. I said she wasn't the most maternal. Um, she she they had this marvelous woman Charlotte Charlotte Fisher, who ran the show really. She was Agatha's secretary, but she was more. And um, the big question, in a way, is how much did Charlotte know? Because there's this thing of the adver the advertisement that was left in the Times, you know, friends of Theresa Neal contact, blah, blah. Another sort of clue. I don't know that. No, do tell us. I'm sure the listeners don't well, know. Well, I, I, I can't make head or tail of it, Phil, if the truth be told. Um, there's an advert. And when you see it in the Times, it's so, you know, it's it friends and rel relatives of Theresa Neal contact box number, whatever, which appeared in the Times on... Oh, I don't know, the following week after the disappearance. And I'm assuming that was aimed at Charlotte. But to what end, I don't know, because I met I met I met all the people who were still alive. I talked to Agatha's daughter, I talked to Archie's son by Nancy Neal. I talked to Charlotte's niece, and she said, you know, Charlotte was under suspicion. The idea that if she'd really known anything, she wouldn't have told the police is is not feasible. And Agatha's daughter was of the view that it was, yes, it was a, a, a woman out of her mind making a plan, as it were, to, to save her marriage. Because I think the last thing she intended to do was disappear for 11 days. But I suppose once you're in it, what do you do? Well, what was she doing in Harrogate? Like, yes, she was. She was running around this hotel in Harrogate, having dinner, playing cards. People, well, all the front pages were filled with her picture. People saying, "You look a little bit like that woman in the in the papers," and nothing happened. And the <laughs> press jumped around saying she hasn't signed in under her real name, so she can't be here. Yes, they did say that. That was um, well. We don't quite know what she was doing in the hotel because. As you know, with things like this, a lot of people come forward afterwards and say, oh, I, you know, I had dinner with her. I did this. I did that. There's not much that's proved. Um, we do know that she, we do know that she played the piano and signed a piece of music to another guest because that came up for auction. So that we know. And we know that she stayed in the hotel and had dinner in the hotel and occasionally went out and bought, you know, something to wear or something. It's like someone drifting, almost like having a rest from your real life or something. You know, that thing people, some people say she was in a fugue state, which covers a multitude of sins, really. But in a way that I think that is right, because... She, you know, her life was so painful. What I think she was just waiting for this to be over, really. Um, well, you also have a comment that the, the, um, the 11 days of the creation of an artist, a writer, and writers live life differently. Yes. As long as she was creating, a, a slightly subconsciously creating a drama. Yes, I do think that. I mean, 
you know, a huge amount of my book is dedicated to this because I think I just think it's so incredibly interesting because you might think about doing something like this, but to do it. I mean, I was so obsessed with it. I, I actually sort of reenacted it in so far as was possible. I drove from my flats in Richmond to the house styles in Sunningdale. And then I drove to Newlands Corner on 3rd of December, I think it was 2005. And that, it, it was scary. It was scary. That was how I knew it wasn't a stunt because nobody would do that unless they were in extremis. You know, it was very unnerving. The idea that she spent hours in that place because she must have done. She must have been in a, in a terrible, terrible anguish. You, you, you think just, she she went there? I mean, for example, was it known to be a place where people had killed themselves in the past? Do you think she went there with perhaps half a mind to do something like that and then defaulted to something else? Or do you think she always planned the trip to Harrogate? I think we know she got Harrogate in her mind the next morning because she left a ring at Harrods. It's also Agatha Christie, Harrods and, you know... Um, she left a ring at Harrods and said, to be repaired, please send this to Mrs. Neal at the Harrogate Hydro. So she knew what she was going to do the next morning. The night of the 3rd of December, no, I, I, I think she had suicide in her mind. For sure I do. Because where she drove to was quite near where he, Archie, was spending the weekend with friends, these frightful people who sort of encouraged the relationship with Nancy Neal. Nancy was there. Um, I think she drove, she might even have gone and driven and looked at the house. That's the sort of thing you do when you're in that kind of love hell. Um, she, it's not, a, it's not somewhere you would naturally kill yourself because it's a, it's hills, you know, it's, it's vertiginous, but it's not, you don't, you wouldn't jump off. But I mean, she, she wrote these books, which I'm sure you know, these Mary Westmacott books, six of them, which are the opposite of her detective fiction. They're all emotion, they're all unresolved, they're everything, and I think they're all about Archie, really. And there's one that is directly autobiographical, unfinished portrait. I mean, it's the story of losing her mother, it's the story of the marriage. And in that, the woman goes to kill herself. And I think that's... True, I think that's so she, so she changed her mind, uh, and then went up to Harrogate. Did you go up to Harrogate as well and, and stay for 11 days? No, not 11 because I wouldn't have been able to afford 11, but um, I have been to that hotel quite a few times, yeah, because it's 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 so fascinating. I always think of her coming down those stairs and him being there and thinking. And then it all went horribly wrong. And I, I just feel real, I do feel real compassion for her. Because it had a huge impact on the rest of her life, really, didn't it? Absolutely. It, it did. And how she rebuilt her life from that is, is impressive. But, I mean, I think the year after was worse, really, because you haven't even got adrenaline or hope or anything. And she had to, she didn't have a lot of money. You know, people think she was very privileged. There really wasn't much money. So she had to become a writer. Well, she was a writer, but her career up to that point had been, you know, she'd do a thriller, she'd do short stories, she'd do... It was really Roger Ackroyd, which I always find this weird as well, came out in the middle of all this, you know, came out between her mother dying and Archie saying he wanted to leave her. And in the middle of it, you get Roger Ackroyd. And is, wasn't the idea put up by Lord Mountbatten? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, yeah. Well, or is that him taking that. credit for something? <laughs> did he, did, 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 I mean, did you find that he had said that? Because I found a letter he'd written to her. Did you? Did, did yes, he, that's he, the same letter. Yeah, he claimed credit. Uh, and she was very polite back. But whether, but he took a lot of credit for a lot of things he didn't do. It was... Well, his idea was a bit more um, Rococo, wasn't it? It was kind of Poirot was going to be arrested for murder. And the idea was 
her, according to her, the idea was given to her by her brother-in-law, who she was very close to. And I always thought, oh gosh, you two should have got married, actually. That would have been really good. But of course, things don't work like that. But it, it, she did, she was very polite to Mountbatten. He used that because it was his son-in-law who wanted to produce Murder on the Orange Express. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. And, and so she allowed that to happen. Okay. So but, you say that you say this was the hinge moment of her life and yes. it sent her on a new direction. Um, do you think creatively in terms of the books that she wrote thereafter, which became more and more successful, it, 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 they, they, they owed something to that trauma that she'd been through? I, I do a bit, but of course, when you're writing these books, you're so tempted to read things into things and that is a fault of mine and you sort of have to try not to do it too much. I, I mean, the Westmacott's, for sure, these six books are, well, they're absolute gold to, to me, they were. And I think a couple of them are really very good. But they, she would never have written those if she'd, I mean, what would her life have been if she'd stayed with Archie? You know, it, it that is the great counterfactual, really, of her life, I think. What would it have been? It would have been much more restricted. Would it have been happier? I doubt she would have become the figure that we talk about. Um, Did she remain in love with him? I mean... I think you say she he was the great love of her life. Yeah, I think she did really, not to sound overly sort of crass about it. I mean, her daughter, who I really you 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 know you feel for in this, she sort of said, "Well, if I saw him, I couldn't tell my mother because it upset her." Um, you know, she was really torn both ways, and she did say to me, "You know, she shouldn't have left him alone." She shouldn't one, one of yeah. the interesting things I thought in the book was you say that Archie is being slightly sort of demonised and actually Max Mallowan, her second husband, has been sort of seen as one of the good guys. And actually, what I found so fascinating, he turned out to be a bit of an old goat, possibly having a long affair with the woman he eventually married after her death, um, which kind of changes our picture a little bit. Mm. So this is, we're rushing, you know, people don't know, this is the second husband we're talking about now. Yeah. So I'm sort of here as to represent the ordinary person. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, you two? Never. It's not Never. some Oxbridge symposium on Agatha Christie. So let's <laughs> do it a bit more, maybe systematically. So she does marry again. Yes, but quite he, quickly. Like, he sounds like a bit of a shit as well, or, or not? I didn't care for him, I have to say. But you, you can't help these responses you have. Um, but but I didn't care for him. No, I thought he was um, a bit frightful, really. But he made her, He it worked for her. And that, of course, is what mattered. She married him again in 1930. Um, she'd met him because what really saved her was this travel, desire for travel that she had and finally daring to travel on her own to Baghdad, which of course was not like Baghdad now, but even so, you know, it was quite a daring thing to do. Um, and she went to an archaeological dig, um, was received with, you know, great admiration as a writer. So it was not this whole Agatha Christie, the woman who disappeared. It was her in a different guise, which must have been restorative. And then she met this much younger man, 14 years younger, uh, Max Mallowan, and he, I mustn't be too censorious, I'm, it, it sort of worked. She had money, he restored her confidence. I always felt he was almost like a replacement for her mother because oh. she, could <laughs> she could relax with him, um, whereas you, which you can't with people you are wildly attracted to, like she was with Archie. And she could relax with him. He was a good companion. He was jolly. He was fun, which Archie wasn't really. And, you know, people, I'm, I met a couple of people who disliked him intensely. But I also met a couple of people who said, you know, he was, he was, he was a, you know, he, he was, he enjoyed life. He, he had spirit and he was intellectually stimulating in a way that Archie probably wasn't. 
all his clever friends at All Souls all thought the world of Agatha. So it was a more, it was a fantastic life, really, that she would not have had as Mrs. Archie Christie. You know, she travelled. She went to almost every country. Know, on so Earth. many of her f most famous books are about that exotic, exactly, exactly, you know, exactly. Orient Express, the Nile, the archaeology here, there, everywhere. And whereas Absolutely. Archie was, you know, gin and tonic and the golf club. It sounds like. Well, he and affairs. Well, only one. Okay. Only, only one, and he. She wrote him a letter when Nancy Neal. Nancy Neal died um, quite young. She died in 1958, and Agatha must have written him a letter. I never saw that, but I saw the letter he wrote back to her saying, "Thank you for giving me those years of happiness with Nancy," which I thought, oh, okay. Um, because it must have been pretty weird being Archie and Nancy, I feel. It, it's, you know, living with the shadow of Agatha Christie. It's not like someone you can put out of your minds. But going back to what you said earlier, Phil, I do feel that some of her novels of the 1930s, they do hark a bit, oh, and 40s as well, Five Little Pigs, which I think is her best book. Um, they hark back to something of that triangular dynamic, I think, the wife or the girl who feels herself being supplanted and thinks if only I could remove that element, life would go back to how it should be. Um, there's an emotional sort of undertow to some of those books, I think, like Sad Cypress very much so, even Death on the Nile, Five Little Pigs massively so. and. But it's it's a hint, you know, you don't have to see it if you don't want to, because those books are extremely impersonal, really. Although you you get a brilliant flavour of her, but I think the intention is to be impersonal, really. Because, you I mean, you say that period was the most productive period of her life, really, and they slightly tailed off later on. I mean, are there books that perhaps readers might not know, I mean, less well-known, which you really rate? I mean, you, you mentioned a few just now. Yes, that, that's a wonderful opportunity to, I mean, I think a book like The Hollow, which is just after the war, I mean, it's not an incredibly complicated mystery, but the, what I love is when she solves the human, the human dynamic is, is and you feel the resolution of character because although some people say oh she didn't do people she couldn't do people i think that's extremely far from the truth the, but almost the opposite of the truth she doesn't do character in depth of course she doesn't but i do think it's it's truthful i do think she's always truthful i think she's extremely wise, wiser in her books than in life and something like the hollow which is a, a, a wonderful human dynamic I think that is the most marvellous book. Um, Five Little Pigs, I think, does now get more of an airing. Taken at the Flood, written after the war. Tremendous sense of that destabilisation in society. You know, she's this kind of... She's a bit of a social historian in her indirect way, I think. Uh, I think it's marvellous that we can talk about her this way now, because when I started writing the book, people thought I was insane for taking her seriously, you know. And I don't want to make ridiculous claims and make out she's some sort of, but I do think when she's at her best and the, the characters and the plot are sort of distilled into one, so the workings of plot are also the workings of character, which is done best in Five Little Pigs, in my view. I don't think anyone else can do that. Nobody else can do that, that simplicity. You know, it would take them twice as many words for a start. And nobody really knows how she did it because she is actually an instinctive writer. But and she had very detailed notebooks, didn't she? I mean, we, we, we and, and or rather just the back of envelopes and the back of sort of recipes. But she, she clearly was plotting the whole time. We kind of imagined that they, they kind of just came to her. Yes. Um, and because they're so conceptual like the ABC murders, you know, I was amazed to see how much she went through to come up with that plot, which feels like just, you know, like that. Um, oh, and a book like Crooked House, which I also think is a masterpiece, 
you know, in and it starts with, a, the notebook starts with her saying something like, so who kills who? And you sort of think, gosh, did you not know that before you start? You know, it's just the way her mind works, the working towards simplicity, which is, um, I find extremely admirable and that she would actually then write them in about six weeks. Um, but the, the, you know, Max Malouin, he during the war when he was in North Africa and doing whatever he was doing, who knows? And she knew, she knew, you know, there was a 14 year age gap. She, she knew that there might be, um, what can one say, incidents. She knew that, uh, but she didn't mind the way she did about Archie. But he would also write her letters saying, oh, I've just read Murder at the Vicarage or something. Yes, it's clever. It's almost too clever. And your grammar isn't right or something like that. You know, and I just think, oh, yeah, you like the money that's come from them. Um, but it, I shouldn't say this because it, as, as, a, as a construct, the marriage worked. And she, as I, as I was saying earlier, she sort of lived in, a, in an odd way, hand to mouth because so much money that she earned then went in tax. But she still lived in a very grand style. She had Greenway in Devon, which anyone who's visited will know is the most beautiful place. I mean, it's just sublime. And she had a house in London and of course this travel that she did all, you know, this wonderful travel. And then when Max was running his own dig, bankrolled by Agatha, but Nevertheless, she enjoyed it. She enjoyed dig life. And I think it was a respite to her, for her, um, particularly as her fame grew. She could just go there and be Mrs. Malouin and clean the ivories with her Pons face cream and, um, and write, write undisturbed. I mean, what struck me reading the book is very much the experience I had writing about John Buchan 30 years ago. Everyone underrated them as a writer. They were accused of racism and anti-Semitism. And, and you deal with, with these questions, I think, very well, showing that they, you know she was, as you say, a much more complex writer and actually a less prejudiced writer than people realise. Well, thank you, because that is a... I mean, you will know it's that's an issue one comes up against. Um, this ridiculous contemporary desire to judge people according to the prejudices of today rather than uh, 50, 100 years ago or whatever. I mean, it, it's, one can only hope people get over it. But um, I mean, there are occasional moments in her books when you just think, I would just take that word out. And I think they have now. But how you can call someone a racist who lived about half the year in the Near East, um, you know, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. She well, was. We, a, we spoke about this actually in, in Putney. Do you, um, outside Britain, she is often known as the anti-British writer. People liked her books because she punctured the sort of pompous idea of the respectable British bossing half the world and quietly committing all these horrible crimes, and which always came back to haunt them in the end. So she was seen as being quite progressive, I think. Um, that's so interesting. France. Yeah, I remember you saying that's so interesting, isn't it? That, that's that's how she was marketed. The people who didn't like the British would love this book. <laughs> that's so funny because you know you the, our received image of her is 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 such a cliche. I mean, I think it's been um, dispelled now through the twenty first century. I hope it has. Um, not. Although in a weird way, these modern adaptations, they sort of undercut her in a way because they they use her stories, they use her plots, which are so marvellous and indestructibly um, compelling, in order to undercut what she allegedly stands for. So maybe you should um, tell these modern adapters how she was viewed. <laughs> in her time, because I think that would surprise a lot of people. Well, there are, I can think Who of it? plots that yeah. were certainly sins of the empire, things that had been done out in the far-flung world of pine trees and palm trees come back to haunt people. There's lots of that. 
There is. There absolutely is. Um, um, I mean, a lot of people look a bit like a husband. Get their comeuppance. But also, it's a bit like any good writer. They can be reinterpreted for every generation. And clearly, with these new films every Christmas, which have brought a whole new readership, um, we're, we're getting a slightly different take. And as you said, the irony is they feel they're being rather clever. And all they're doing is actually falling into to what she perhaps was even hinting at. Yes, I do. We should, push, I mean... we should push Laura's book. If you want to understand Agatha Christie, buy Laura's wonderful book. which will be Yes, I agree. This, linked to this podcast. It is, I think it is the definitive book. I mean, no one, I mean, people have written other books since, but they haven't really added anything to the story. Um, and I mean, you've done the hard work, the the the, the research, and uh, it, it seems, you know, having read the other books, that there, there isn't really much that they add to the story since yours. Well, that, oh gosh, that's, 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 honestly, that means a lot, Andrew, because I did, well, I was very lucky. You know, I was given access to everything, her family were pretty marvelous to me. There's no doubt about it. And they didn't take anything out or make any demands. You know, I was very, very, very lucky. Um, so I don't know that there is much more to be perfectly honest, but as you say, there is reinterpretation. Although I will never buy the idea that she was a feminist. I mean, she was in how she lived. She was not in how she thought. You can't put these contemporary things onto people, you know, she was enraged when someone said, are you like Miss Marple? She said, no, I'm not. She's a spinster. I've been married twice. You know, she just, she, she, she didn't see life in those ways. Her books are supremely anti-ideological in every respect. You know, even books that nobody reads, like Destination Unknown, which I kind of love. It's a plea, really, for moderation, for Dis for healthy scepticism, for disbelief in ideology. You know, everyone should go and read it now, I think. Gosh, well, amen to that. Very, very good point. Um, well, I think it's, you know, and it led some people to think she was naive or, you know, didn't couldn't see, uh, lacking in sophistication. Well, that's the last thing she was. And she never worried about shocking her. I remember P.D. James saying to me, oh, she'll kill children. You know, most of us are very nervous of that. She was um, she was very like Miss Marple in that respect. She was unshockable. Oh. And I mean, the mousetrap. I don't. We're not supposed to talk about the mousetrap, even though it's all these years old. But it's a horrible story of abuse. It is, I mean, and 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 cruelty. And she was she had a very dark side to her. Yeah, well, I've heard Patricia Highsmith. Girl. Sorry, same sort of thing. Patricia Highsmith just yeah. reassessed now. Same, I mean, not, you know, again, sort of misunderstood perhaps in her time and now uh, appreciated. Yes, that's interesting. But because Agatha always does it, this incredibly simple style, which, you know, I was reading when I was nine or whatever with, with absolute ease, um, you know, again, that has led people far less now to think, to mistake simple for simplistic. And actually, as we know, to write simply is a damn sight harder than to fill it all out, flesh it all out. You know, you read a book like Towards Zero, the solution of which is as dark, as dark as anything ever written by Highsmith or Ruth Randall or any of that. But you don't have to read it that way. It just sort of rattles around in your mind after. She's an extraordinary writer, really, because it's so impressionistic and it only ever gives you what you need. And I can only think of that as just a very happy instinct. I mean, she wasn't really educated in any formal way or anything. I sometimes wonder if that goes with them. Um, <laughs> if, you know, our English degrees sometimes knock some of that out of us. I don't know. Well, look, um, I think we probably wrap this up because we've had nearly an hour. Uh, oh, no, we fascinating. really? Oh, my God. We could go okay. on for longer. No, no, you, we, we need you to be our, our literary critic. Um, oh well, I—I I mean, read the book. Of... Read the book. Is yeah, the I'd answer. say that to anybody watching or listening. Do read, do read this book if you've got any interest in Agatha Christie. It is so well written, and like all of Laura's works, full of humanity and insight. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank so you. Much. Thank you for being our first hat trick. No more mugs, though. I'm afraid you only get one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, no, that's one. No, get, send her. Well, you can make it a T-shirt if you're very lucky. <laughs>
Oh my God, are you serious? You're doing TJ. This is a whole merchandising thing. Oh, oh yeah, yes, wait, yes, 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 yes. We're okay. challenging. Where do we get the, the, the Duchess, Duchess of York here? Sports, sportswear, you know. Um, I'll wait for the baseball cap. <laughs> <laughs> All the best. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Well, a real bumper edition. Um, good. I mean, could have gone on longer. Fascinating. Um, what she had to say. Uh, yeah, she and, has, I, I do love the way she thinks and talks. Yeah, and I mean, really, really good writer. So, um, I hope that will lead people to both her book and Agatha Christie's books. Yeah, but, I guess it's um, timeless. I mean, it's funny, as Laura was saying, she is kind of <clears throat> a social. Uh, conventions of her time you know she's not a modern person in that sense uh, she's kind of very much of her period and yet she does things we would regard as very modern very dark themes um betrayal abuse hypocrisy um I and mean, that that's just part of the human condition i mean you know shakespeare would have recognized some of those characteristics she's timeless yeah well i think each generation you know comes to her afresh and sees fresh things in her but i i, I agree and i think she makes the point very early on in the book uh, with the new introduction that that she is a very contemporary figure in many ways and that's why the modern dramatists really can see something there they can they can play with yeah i quite like these modern versions actually i'm not sure laura does i quite like them um and i think it does help help her reach a, a bigger younger audience maybe we yeah. should abandon this scandalous stuff and just do a literary criticism show what do you reckon yes well i'd be happy i'll have john bucket in next up next week See what other people think. Well, Scandalmongers does cover a variety of crimes. We were criticised for using it as a title, I think, to start with. It's seen as a bit down market. But it does cover a wide range of subjects. I still feel our our, our championing of, of investigative journalism is still a very, should be a very strong uh, thread. No, I agree. Actually, that's a good excuse to talk about next week. Because we're having yes. a themed week, aren't we, coming up? Do you want to tell yes. people what's, what's going on? Well, I'm very excited because it's my subject, spies. Uh, we've got um, uh, Robert Verkirk talking about the, the Gareth Williams case, which he was going to write a book about. This is a man, uh, an MI6 agent GCHQ employee who was found dead in a bag. And the great mystery is how he got inside this bag and why he died. And then on the Wednesday, we are looking at the John Vassell case, the author, uh, Alex Grant, who's just written a very good book on him. Uh, talks about Vassal actually being much more a victim than than perhaps a spy, uh, and so two slightly different takes on 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 modern spying, and they both have a, a, a sort of sexual element to them um, as well. Um, Vassal blackmailed really for being gay at a time when that was still illegal, um, and the, uh, people had to live very secretive lives. Um, our friend Jonathan Brewer wrote sent us some. Uh, some press cuttings from the early 60s about the case. It's astonishing. I mean, this is our lifetime, Andrew. A front page of a national newspaper. How to spot a hobo. I mean, yes, well, Alex talks world. about that in the book, yes. And they like talking to all ladies or something and eating and drinking tea. Yes, if they're flamboyantly dressed and they're close to their mothers, it's a sign they might be homosexual. So right. Oh. Social history as well as a great spy story. So that's that. And then, yes, the Gareth Williams. I mean, they sort of, I don't know whether they were trying to smear him. But there's a suggestion of he was into S and M bondage, you know. Maybe he put himself in the bag as part of some bizarre auto erotic thing. Um, yeah, and like dressing up as a woman as well. They threw in. Yeah, I mean, all human so, life is here. Yeah, but was it the Russian mafia? Was it a game that went wrong? Or, or, and why were MI six so unhelpful when this police investigated it? Yeah, that one. So I think that's, that's going to be a really good week. It, yeah, um, it looks really dodgy, lots. isn't it? Yeah, we've got lots, lots going on. Lots lined up. Yes, we have. We have lots lined up. Um, Blood scandals. scandal. We've got some sport. Would you believe? Snooker. A scandal in the world of snooker coming soon. Snooker and Sheffield. I mean, that must be a first. Yeah, well, Harrogate, Sheffield. We're covering all the main Yorkshire bases. And and then Martin Rosenbaum talking about um, FOI, um, Freedom of Information. Yeah. He's a great expert. And so we're we're looking how we pair them. Do Do, do people like themed programs or are we are they happy just with individual programs twice a week so yeah. do tell us what you think we're still young we're still experimenting we're still growing and we're still grateful so if you've enjoyed this show please like it um if you haven't yet please subscribe on youtube yeah. that makes a big difference to us and, and do contact listening. us 
because there's there's a mug in it. Yes, do contact us, and, and we're going to give a monthly mug for the best comments. We're, we're already given one. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great. See you on Sunday. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio.